Paranormal Dimensions is a regular feature on Mondays on the Paranormal UK radio network. It hasn't changed in millions of years. But here, here we have a clue to an answer. Hello, this is Michael Feely, and you're listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network, the UK's biggest paranormal network, and this is Paranormal Dimensions with David Young. Hello, and welcome to the show. Thank you for that intro, Michael. I chose Michael's intro because uh, he was on the show a few, well, a few shows back, and um, we touched on a few of the subjects that we'll be covering on this show. Knights Templar and Secrets of the Vatican. Uh, today's guest is Frank Willis. Now, you may know that Frank was on the show about, well, probably about a year ago now. Frank's a good friend, and I'm very happy to welcome him back to the show. Welcome to the show, Frank Willis. Hello, Frank. How are you doing? Hey, yeah. Hey. Yeah. Right, welcome to the show, and um, I haven't seen you since, what, September, wasn't it, when you you, you were at my home when you after the uh, the Colonel Holt conference, um, yeah. when when you gave us an amazing de- demonstration of transfiguration and medium, mediumship, and uh, I was really knocked out by that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, you know, it's pretty normal for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I actually... You when, know, I, was, I, was, I say, when you sat there... I was first aware of you say when you sat there Sorry. and you give give us you know, and you sat there with the in the the low light, and I was thinking, oh, nothing's going to happen. We probably, but but I was actually, I mean, there was three of us that saw it, and um, I was actually knocked out by it. I think you had about three different transfigurations, and um, yeah. but you say it's quite normal for you. Yeah, sometimes it happens when I'm I'm not even aware of it happening, like at the prop conference few years ago it's in Phenomenon magazine uh, the editor uh, Brian he he witnessed it and then he interviewed a few people in the audience who also witnessed it but yeah it's in Phenomenon magazine yeah now I remember people uh, talking but, about it going back to, uh, g- going back to when I was first aware of it it was when I was married to my first wife she she woke me up uh or I actually woke up, I'm not sure, uh, but she was petrified, you know, and the fear in her face, and I said, what's wrong? Hmm. And she said, I woke up, and you were sat up in bed, and you were speaking in a foreign language, and you went, she said, I went, are you okay, Frank? And uh, I just looked at her, and my face was different, spoke something, and waved. Hmm. And it turns out it was a Native American Indian. Uh, who's later on I found out he's one of my spirit guides but yeah he totally scared her you know she she used to be quite religious actually and uh, she got out of bed onto her knees and were praying to God about it well wow. you know like and I will say at this point in time uh, anything I say about religion it's I'm not against religion because people believe what they believe and yeah. if it helps them it must be right for them yeah sure even though, even though I don't believe in it but like I say my me, me first wife she was religious and she used to pray every night before getting into bed nothing wrong with it you know that, that was her viewpoint on life and I will not knock it hmm well, that's right. I mean, yeah. it's, it's an important part of a lot of people's lives, isn't it, religion? Um, you know, like you say, if it helps them, then... I mean, I'm not religious myself either. Um, but religions do 
kind of interests me, you, you know, because you, you have to sort of look at the similarities between a lot of the religions and think, well, why are you all fighting about it, you know? Well, yeah, oh, I remember uh, my daughter, when she was at junior school, she was in the nativity play, and the headmaster did a speech before the play, and I burst out laughing, because hmm. he said uh, Jesus died on the cross for all our sins and to bring peace on earth and 2,000 years later in Jerusalem they're still fighting hmm. so you know that's what I, I found funny um, yeah. if, if Jesus did exist you know why did he die you know what was it all for and I will say I was brought up a Catholic so I, I know that side of it but it just, it just doesn't do anything for me other than I believe it was there for control. Yeah. You know, people, if they want to believe in God or Allah, whoever, Buddha, if it does them well, it, then it's working. Hmm. But the minute they gather together and use it in the name, you know, like recently we've had all this ISIS and they're like, Shouting Allah Rahbar and God is great, and it's like, what what the hell are you fighting for? You know, isn't God a peaceful God in your terms? Yeah. You know, and I can't get my head around that. No. Which brings us to the Knights Templars. You know, they they uniform the white mantle, which was given to them by the Pope, and then the red cross on it. The, the red cross represents martyrdom. If you die fighting for God, you're gonna to go to heaven. And it's like, well, isn't God the all loving, peaceful God? Mm. In, you know, Christianity terms. And the Knights Templars were Christians. So I, I have that big duality, you know, with organized religions. Or institutes. Yeah. You, know, you can have a religion and there's no churches or anything. But a group of people come together and they're peaceful. Well, the minute there's an institution, there's that control. And, you know, the Vatican is very good at it. It's had 2,000 years practice. Yeah. Now, the Knights Templar, they, they sort of sprang from about, was it about nine nights around about 11, or was it 1119 or 1120 or something like that? And I think most of them were French, weren't they? Or something, and they separated off. Yeah. Um, I mean, how did they become so powerful from... Well, they did become powerful, didn't they? From just sort of like nine nine Knights Templars. That's what I can't quite get my head around. Yeah. Uh, well, the first crusade was in 1099. And the crusaders were just normal people, like Richard the Lionheart and them kind of people. Hmm fighting against the Muslims uh, the order of the Knights Templars were founded in 1118 and then it weren't until 1127 uh, Udipayan and the Knights Templars returned to France from Jerusalem but the big mystery is when the seven Templars rode into Jerusalem they took it from the Muslims Yeah, and it's like well how? But how did they do it? What what really happened? And that's one of the big mysteries of yeah. the Knights Templars. Was that was that when they, they were called the Saracens then? Weren't they the uh, the? Or was that something yeah. different? Well, I'm, I'm right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, they were the Saracens. Yeah. Um, so there was seven. I thought I thought it was nine. So it, it didn't sound like a bit of a film, in it? The seven of <laughs> approaching. Anyway, <laughs> but um. Yeah, so how did they become so powerful through that, though, Frank? The, I, I really don't know, but the, you know, uh, what do you call it, mysteries of surrounding it is the, they were digging for the, uh, the ark, uh, what's it called? The, the ark. Oh, uh, the ark of the covenant, was it? That's it, ark of the covenant. I couldn't get, I couldn't remember what you called that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they were allegedly digging for the Ark of the Covenant, but I think they found uh, the treasures of King Solomon or King David 
because they back then they used to have a, the habit of burying treasures so that the enemy won't find them. And I think the Knights Templars, in looking for the Ark of the Covenant, came across the treasures because when they returned to France in 1127, they were rich. You know, they, they had all that wealth. Yeah. And it, it's, well, where did it come from? But archaeology is still uncovering some of the truth. Hmm. And uh, one of the legends of it is that they actually dug under the Temple Mount where they were looking for the Ark of the Covenant and found the treasures. Uh, amazingly the Israelis today are still digging under it even though it's in control of Muslims now hmm. and a lot of animosity going on between the Israelis and Muslims in Jerusalem yeah over the archaeology digs yeah I'll tell you so you know it's it, it's like any legend of treasure you know a typical example is like Oak Island they're, they're still digging hundreds of years later for the treasure in Oak Island you know they, they, keep, they keep coming across things in archaeology which spurs them on to try and find the truth whether they will or not I don't know just just like whether the Templars found all that treasure in Jerusalem or not I really don't know hmm. was that the, uh, were they looking for the Holy Grail at, at the same time or was that something uh, a separate thing I, I think they were looking for the Ark of the Covenant, but the Holy Grail, I think the Knights Templars already knew what the Holy Grail was. You know, it weren't actually the chalice that Jesus drank out of at the Last Supper. I think it was Jesus' bloodline. Oh, right. So it wasn't actually a, a cup of, of, of some... It was actually a, a non-physical thing. Is that what you mean? Yeah. It, it's... Like in esoteric terms, and you'll see in the, you know, right in the tarot cards, the cups, the ace of cups is representing the chalice of Jesus. But it's, it's like, what is a cup? A cup is a vessel that contains things, or it contains information, or it contains DNA. And I think that's what the, the Templars knew, and we're looking for. Hmm. That's actually quite interesting because a couple of shows back, oh, I don't know if you heard it, but I had Michael Feely on the show, and his um, belief is that a lot of uh, things about like Jesus never existed, and actually um, God is within us ourselves, you know, and a lot of things that were that's in us, it's all been sort of uh, blocked off from us ourselves, so we we only sort of do you see what I'm well, saying? It's, it's, definitely. Yeah, you know, our own knowledge is blocked off, yeah. off from ourselves, sort of thing about it. Yeah, definitely, you know, if you go back to uh, like the, the times of the great Greek philosophers, you know, uh, Hippocrates, Aristotle, hmm. they believed. Well, Hippocrates definitely believed in curing the mind, body, and spirit, and his symbol is the caduceus which represents the seven chakras and the yin and yang uh, chi flowing upwards to the godhead which is the wings and he actually believed if there was an imbalance in the body it was also in the aura and he called that imbalance pneuma and hence that's where we get the word pneumonia from uh, you know. yeah. so the word you know, as physicians, curing people in mind, body and spirit. And it weren't until the Vatican came along that they separated the mind, body and spirit into the Vatican wanted control of the spirit. And anything beyond that was given to the physicians. So the physicians could only cure the body. So, you know, uh, as, as a healer myself, I know that any illness in the body usually manifests in the aura first. And in the case of like women with breast cancer, you can see it in the aura six months before it manifests actually in the body itself. Really? Mm. So the, the vascular was separating that. And of course, we now know that 
the Vatican controls the spirit or religion doctors control the body and then psychologists, psychiatrists control the mind so it's broken into three factions and you know the, there's, there's a lot in medical science which is brilliant but there's a lot that they will deny you know it's, uh, they deny she exists even though the caduceus symbol of the medical profession shows it in plain sight that yeah. it's this, the chakras and the yin and yang you know it, 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 it baffles me why even today that a lot of doctors and medical profession deny that chi exists well I've seen you demonstrate chi so I, can I, know say, I, I know it exists as well <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah. your, your demonstration of breaking those uh, roof tiles how many of them was it in on um... uh, 18 concrete slabs yeah there's a video out there everyone who's, who's listening to this show um, if you look if you if you google Frank Willis breaking 18 slabs of um, or roof slabs uh, it, you still hold the record don't you Frank yeah yeah, yeah. well that's, that's that's using chi uh, the power of chi and it is quite yeah. amazing to see it, actually. There's also a, a TV program which is on YouTube, and it's called Superhuman, where a guy breaks nine concrete slabs, and uh, the I think it was Salford University were testing it all out, and they came to the conclusion that he, he practiced and practiced. And he was exerting a force of 600 pounds per square inch on them. Hmm. Now, that's just nine where I've done 18. Which now, is twice the amount. I've asked Salford yeah. University. Yeah. Yeah. I've asked Salford University to explain it and the usual is, oh, go away. Right. You know, they, they don't want to go down the route that chi, chi energy, sorry, chi energy exists. Yeah. I wonder why. The, the friend. The, it, again, it's the overthrows of the Vatican and the hundreds of years of persecution. You know, it, it went until 1951 that the Witchcraft Act was repealed. Up until then, I was classed as a witch and doing witchcraft, which is like is an admittance that it does exist. Yeah. You know now that law changed slightly where uh, I think it's uh, proving clairvoyance or uh, charlatans or something I, I can't remember the exact law but there is a law you know to, to state that clairvoyance are either real or they're not real now just the fact that that law exists proves that there's a phenomenon there yeah. You know, if it was all a lot of hawk and pork and there'd be no laws about it. That's true, yeah. When you think about it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, going back all them hundreds of years when the Vatican uh would like started persecuting people for having a different belief to them and then the birth of the witchcraft act, it's like, well, what were you scared of? Mm. You know, what were you fighting against? A very real phenomenon. Hmm. I, I, I found the, the witchcraft act. It was born from King James the first when he, he translated the Bible. He already, I think it was Norway he was in. He, he'd already witnessed and actually put to death one hundred witches himself. So when he became the king of England uh, he was also the king of Scotland and Ireland the only king to be the king of all three countries but he brought in the witchcraft act because of the uh, witch trials going on from Pendle witches and it was basically what happened there one young girl said that there were witches in the village of Pendle and of course hysteria went you know, because people were superstitious and, you know, cattle were dying and one or two other things were happening in the village. So they, they were like, right, they must be witches. 
persecute them. So they took them through the trough and ball and to Lancaster Castle and they put them on trial. But they didn't know what to try them with. So King James brought in the Witchcraft Act and he put into the Bible a section where it says, Suffer not a witch living in among you. So that was the birth of the uh, Witchcraft Act. And of course, there was, I think there was 10 witches hung. And there, there was 11 on trial. But yeah, 10 of them were hung. And it, it was just, why? They were probably, you know, old, old Mother Demdike, she was one of them. She was probably, you know, the, the wise woman of the village. Hmm. Where if anybody was ill, she'd use herbs to heal them or whatever. You know, but it started. And then people like Matthew Hopkins, which find a general, started making a living out of going around and putting witches on trial. And they were all innocent, you know, and, and executing them. And then across Europe was the Inquisition. And in Spain, itself, the Spanish Inquisition. It was horrendous. You know, you either believe in the Vatican's way, or we'll put you to death. Yeah, there's, there seems to be some sort of a, a system there, don't there? Like a mafia system, where these people were being sent there to sort of shut everybody up, or the sound of it. Oh, definitely. It, it was control. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll give an example of the Cathars. They, they owned a lot of land in southwest of France, and they were becoming powerful. So, the King of France and the Pope sent to a mercenary army and in one day they killed 10,000 of them in, in a village wow. well in a city but the, a lot of them were actually Catholics themselves and they weren't Cathars and to try and justify it you know the couple of abbots and the actual Pope himself they, they said well kill them anyway because God will sort them out God will judge them yeah. And, you know, it was just horrendous. Yeah. So, when the Knights nice Templars were becoming powerful, of course, we know what happened on Friday the 13th. You know, the, the, the Templars became that powerful across Europe that the Pope was becoming fearful of them, and that King Philip of France, he owned, he literally owned a lot of France to them. You know, they became that powerful. So the only way to eradicate them was to say, oh, they were all heretics. Let's arrest them and put them, burn them at the stake. Which is like, it's like the uh, modus operandi of the Vatican. Yeah. You know, do as we do and we'll put you to death. You mentioned Friday the 13th, is that where that came from? Yeah, yeah it is. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, uh, it was October the 13th, which was a Friday, in 1307. And uh, King Philip sent across France to arrest the Templars. But the Pope, he also, it was Pope Clement. He also put an order across Europe to arrest any Templars. Right. So that must so be where they were, they were sort of going under, underground, was it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's like anything, you know, if you make it illegal, it will go underground. Yeah. Well, there is talk that they even, uh, some, a couple, few of them even went to America. There was a, there was something on the History Channel, uh, I think it was a few weeks back now, and they said the signs that the, the, the Templars actually made it to America. You know. Uh, definitely. Because that's where my interest in the Templars first came about. You know, as a kid I used to see the, the film, you know, Richard the Lion or, mm. you know, the, the Crusaders and all them kind of films. But for me it was, uh, uh, Prince Henry Sinclair, who was a Templar, and he was 50 years before Columbus went to America. He was in America 
well, probably a hundred years before uh, Columbus, sorry, but fifty years before Columbus went to America, Sir Henry Sinclair built Roslyn Chapel. Yeah. Right. It was oh, probably thirty five years ago when I first went to Roslyn Chapel. And I didn't know anything about all this. And we're going around and having a look and, and I saw this archway and into the archway it was caught going on the cobs. And I, I asked the guide, I went, was this church built 50 years before Columbus went to America? And she said, yes, it was. And I went, well, can you explain them corn on the cobs there? And she's oh, just yeah. like, yeah. changed the subject. She didn't there. Well, for anybody, you know, who knows, corn on the cobs were indigenous to America. So Sir Henry Sinclair had to have gone to America to see what corn on the cobs looked like. Yeah. It's, it's likely brought some back. There's a massive clue there, isn't it? <laughs> sort of laid right in front of yeah. your eyes. Very massive. Yeah. So it's like, that intrigued me. It's like, who was Sir Henry Sinclair? And I started researching him and I've been ever since. But yeah, he definitely went to America. And like you said, you know, what was on the History Channel and whatnot, the clues are there. And there's one tower, I forget whereabouts in America it is, it's on the East Coast. Uh, but it's typical Templar architecture and even now the, the, uh, the archaeologists are starting to rethink the history you know they've been in denial about it because mm. they're under pressure but new new people are coming into archaeology and they're coming well here's the facts yeah you know why this here and the old school you know they're dying off so they can't argue anymore yeah like what we were taught at school, but the Christopher Columbus and all that is probably well out of date now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, even though it's still being taught in schools. Yeah, that's true. That Columbus discovered America. Yeah. It's like, no, he didn't. You know, the First Nations discovered it. Well, in actual fact, it was uh, nobody discovered it because it was already there with the Indians anyway. So uh, the indigenous people well, were there. Right. <laughs> that's it, the First Nation. Yeah. You know, but, but schools, they're an institution, uh, rightly or wrongly, you know, they, they teach kids and part of it's brainwashing. Yeah. You know, my own experience of school, I, I grew up in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, and at the time, you know, one school trip, you know, a lot of schools used to go on a school trip to Zimbabwe ruins. And, uh, the official stance when I was at school was it was probably built by Portuguese explorers in the 16th century because no black man had the technology or the brains to do it. Hmm. Now, since Rhodesia fell and Zimbabwe came into power, the truth came out and the, the truth about the archaeology came out where, yes, it was a black man that built it, and yes, there was a, a massive trading organization right across Africa, you know, which the European white man tried to eradicate hmm. and, and said, no, it wasn't. But it, the fascinating thing about Africa as well, well, Southern Africa, uh, I recently had a bit of an argument with somebody and they were calling those white road Asians all sorts of names. And I went, all oh, right, okay. Well, do you know where the word Kafir comes from? And this person just shut up straight away because she was Muslim. And I went, yeah, exactly. You you forget about the slave trade. Mm. Where they went down Africa, the Muslims. And, you know, the word Kafir is a Muslim word. Mm. Mind you, I think we, we were all guilty of it. Well, say we, our, our ancestors were all guilty of slavery, weren't we, uh, way back? Um, yeah. Certainly, certainly England had its big, big role to play because I think it was supplying America with slaves all, all those years. Uh, it was a terrible, terrible time. Yeah. Well, go back to King James. He promised the landowners in the West Indies he'd get 50,000 slaves. Hmm. The first 7,000 slaves 
were up Scottish and Irish and it came after the Battle of Preston they were, they were rounded up and all the ordinary Jacobites they were shipped off to Montserrat and you know I, they were the first 7,000 that went and they went from Preston Preston was a major slave trading town huh. and amazingly Preston is very Jesuit yeah. again Catholic Church yeah, we should, yeah, ex Preston, should explain to this point. This is where you live, isn't it, Preston? Or, or near yeah, it? Yeah. No, I, I do live in Preston. Uh, you know, it's, I'm always fascinated by history. But it's a living history in Preston. Some of these places are still there. Hmm. It's, it's like you've got the market, and you've got Market Tavern pub, and the Blackamoor pub. Now the Black and Moor, I used to, have, uh, I've got friends who used to be uh, managing the place. So I've been down in the cellars and I've been all over the place and looking at it. Now in the cellars, the, the original cellars, and the bricked off now, but there's tunnels which went down to the canal docking system where the university is now. And they used to bring the slaves in from uh, Sunderland Point and then later on Glass and Dock wow. down the tunnels into Preston up the tunnels to the Market Tavern and to the Black and Moor and on Market Day they'd bring them up from the cellars and sell them off <laughs> now they, they were also selling them to America you know a lot of the slave traders came over from America hmm. to town like Preston and bought the slaves. No, it is. It's funny that uh, about ten years ago there was a petition going around Preston to get the name of the Black and White Tavern changed because of its racist overtones. Because outside there's the head of a, a Muslim or a Moor, hence the, the name Black and Moor. Right. But it's. In my mind, it's eradicating history. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I agree with you. It's crazy. It, it, it's a terrible part of history, but why eradicate it? Yeah. Leave it there as a lesson for us today. Yeah. You know, which, like, if, if you look at what's happening today, it's a repeat of what were happening in the 1930s Nazi Germany. Mm. You know, we, we got smoking banned. We got arms taken off us, you know, the right to bear arms. Now we're herded into, we're homes, and we're not allowed to go out at the moment. It's like, well, that's what happened in Nazi Germany. Hmm. You know, all that social engineering, which came directly out of the Tavistock Institute in London. So it's like his history repeating itself now, and we're living it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I've never done anything like it to actually be told you can't go out of your home. Uh, obviously, this, is, this will be going out. The week, we'll still we'll still be in lockup, I should think, when this goes out next week. So, uh, and, and uh, how long it's going to carry, go on for, I don't know. But uh, and what's going to be at the end of it, I'm not quite sure either. But um, I, I, I'm beginning to think that things are going to be changed forever from this. Oh, definitely. You know, it, it's a massive attack on our spirit, on our chi. And I, I keep looking at it and keep looking at it, and the figures just do not match. No. I mean, just, just last night, I was looking on the BBC website, you know, BBC News, and looked at their figures. And it, it's, at this moment in time, there's 100,000 women in childbirth have died hmm. more than people around the world have died of this COVID-19 you know they said it's 200,000 people died from it well it's just over 300,000 people have died in childbirth yeah yeah so, I agree there's something not quite right going on I no. mean you, even with the normal flu you get hundreds of thousands dying every year nobody says anything about it do they yeah exactly you know people dying of heart attacks yeah. People from smoking related diseases, from alcoholic, you know, diseases. Nobody says anything. 
you know, but all of a sudden the media are publishing this fear, and you know, it's interesting. I've been watching a couple of like law lords coming out with with stuff on law, and uh, rather than us the people telling politicians what to do, the media is telling them what to do, and they're acting upon what the media are saying. Yeah. And, you know, in my mind, the media, a lot of it's bullshit. Yeah. You know, uh, a, a real good example of that. Do you remember the Dangerous Dogs Act when that was brought in? Yeah. That was because of one politician who decided he wanted to make a name of for himself and he got his friends in the media to start publishing stuff about dogs attacking babies and you know, killing kids and stuff, and you know, he, he presented the problem, and then he wanted the reaction from the people. The people, were, oh, it's, it's bad. This, you know, I'm, every day I'm reading in the paper, a kid's being savaged by a dangerous dog. So then he gives a solution. Well, let's bring in the dangerous dog act. So everybody's happy then, and then the media stops reporting it. There's still the same amount of kids being ra- ravaged by dogs. Mm. We're just not he- hearing about it now. No, you don't hear about it so much, I must say. Yeah, because I mean, there was one particular breed they picked on, wasn't it? But I, I think um, there are a few breeds I think you've got to kind of watch, aren't you, in, from that point of view? Yeah. So well, it, yeah, the, 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 uh, I think it was the American pit bull yeah. the the it in this country. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I think they can be a nasty dog, but I think it's usually down to the training anyway, isn't it, of a dog? Exactly, yeah. I mean, you can train any dog to be vicious or, uh, you know. I mean, what, one of my favourite dogs is the Rhodesian Ridgeback. Yeah. Uh, they were bred to bring down lions. Yeah. So they can be very, very vicious. Yeah. But if you train them right, they were one of the best. Uh, family dogs you can ever have. That's right. You can tra- you can train any dog to be vicious, can't you? Oh, except yeah, maybe my two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly. Uh, I, I've not. I've only ever had one dog, uh, a little Heinz fifty seven dog, and uh, brilliant temperament. Yeah. You know, there were nothing wrong with it, but we trained it right. Yeah. Anyway, I think we've gone off the trail a bit, starting about talking about dogs. <laughs> oh, it is going off the trail, but it's... Yeah, it's kind of linked. I know what you mean about the power thing about it. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think we all go back to this, like, secret government that developed from the um, Freemasons, didn't it, really? Which developed itself from the um, Knights Templar. Is that right? Yeah, kind of. Uh, well, Sir, Sir Henry Sinclair, he was... He, you know, in the Sinclair family, they formed the Scottish Rite of Freemasons, mm. which came out of Roslyn Chapel, or the village of Roslyn. But, they, they, you know, even today, the Freemasons are an organisation. Now, there's, there's a lot of uh, mystique and a lot of bullshit about the Freemasons. Now, I... You know, I'm a biker, and I can liken this to motorcycle clubs like the Hell's Angels. There's a lot of bullshit put out there about Hell's Angels. Mm. And yeah, there has been one or two, like Montbusset in Canada, who his chapter of Hell's Angels, and I will say the Hell's Angels is structured just like the Freemasons where each chapter has its own autonomy you know there, there is no national boss there is no international boss mm. each each chapter is its own chapter yeah, it's like its own family sort of thing isn't it yeah and Mon Bousset in uh, Quebec Canada he used the Hells Angels there and formed his own chapter the, the Nomads and his chapter literally kicked out the uh, Canadian Mafia and within a year he was the major cocaine dealer in Canada <laughs> and they were 
they were making millions each week. So that, but everybody then thinks that all hell's angels are like that, mm. and they're not. No. You know, in England itself, the hell's angels, they're more democratic than Parliament. And there's less criminals in the hell's angels than there is in Parliament. <laughs> You know, there's some nice people in the Hells Angels. Oh yeah, I mean, I've been sad myself as you were quite kind enough to take me to meet a few of them. But uh, yeah, um, you know, so, you know, it's it's how far the media yeah. pushes yeah. the the mystique and how they manipulate it and how they manipulate people's minds to get reactions and you know put fear. And that's what it's all about. Yeah, you know. Everybody used to fear the Vatican and the Witchcraft Act. That slowly died away. So you had to invent the new bogeyman. Uh, 9-11 happened. 7-7 happened. So the new bogeyman was the terrorist. Yeah. And, you know, if you look at the law in this country, the terrorism laws came in the day after 9-11. You know, up until then, there was no terrorist laws. And that's why groups like the IRA were never tried as terrorists. They were all tried on the public misconduct. Mm. So it's why they could never get that uh, recognition as a as an actual army and be treated as uh, POWs. Mm. That's a good point, actually. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. yeah and the other thought, you know, people are scared of martial law and troops on the street. Well, Northern Ireland was part of Britain. Yeah. It still is part of Britain. So it was troops on the street. Mm. You know, it is, it, it, I mean, I, I found a lot of answers to life within the law itself. And, you know, when you, you start learning law and getting your head around what is lawful, what's legal, you start to understand a lot of things. You know, it, a lot of it is born from the Vatican and Christianity. Hmm. Yeah, I think you explained a bit about that the last time you were on, weren't you? Which, incidentally, was about a, just about a year ago, wasn't it? just over a year ago, slightly, which is right, which is yeah. quite strange. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. But uh, that, right. yeah, that thing about unlawful and illegal is is quite a difference there, isn't it? But it's things you don't actually um, you don't actually realise it when you're looking at it on a, in a, on a piece of paper. Oh yeah, it's, some of it. It's like uh, you, you're admitting you're guilty, and you're not actually guilty. Mm. You know, that's where they're trying to con you in law or in legalese, as they call it. You know, if you go back to like English common law, which is what all law is based on, you've got all your answers there. You don't need your acts and statutes. You know, at the moment, there's like guidelines by the government, you know, on this coronavirus stuff, stay indoors and whatnot. It's not against the law yet, even though they're trying to bring in acts, you know, to like give the police powers. But if you still stand under common law, there's nothing they can do. No, that's right. They, they will do it, you know, they'll, they'll still persecute you and stop you in the street and stuff but when you go to actual law court you can have it thrown out mm. well that's what I was saying I mean how, how on earth can they tell you not to be, I mean we all pay our taxes well some of, most of us do anyway <laughs> we, all pay, yeah. we all pay our taxes we pay our road tax to go out in our vehicles we pay insurance and everything else so who has the right to tell us we can't go out in our vehicle for a start you know because we've already paid for that right haven't we yeah, well, you, you're born into that right. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like common law. It's the law of the land. You know, you have the right to travel. I mean, even in your passport, if you open the first page of your passport, it, it says it there, you have the right to travel. Yeah. And you go to a foreign country, you present your passport, and it says there, please treat this person as a British citizen. Which, like, 
I once had the argument down at uh, Barton Moss with the protesters over the fracking. I, I said, why are you protesting? I've oh, got to go against fracking. I said, well, take it to court and contest it. And none of them really knew and they started calling me a freeman of land and slagging me off and stuff. Mm. And I said, well, you've got passports. Show them to the police because the police have to escort you down the road then. <laughs> they're like no no you know I said well it's a public footpath it's not actually a road and you know eventually the fracking stopped there and all these people that were being arrested and what not not one of them was found guilty in court hmm. because I was right all along but you know there's controlled opposition within these groups which oh you've got to protest but no, you don't. If you're protesting for something, you're actually begging for your rights. Because some rights are there already. Yeah. So protest, you're begging for that right. But take it to court and contest it. And the court will rule in your favour. Yeah. Because it is your right. Yeah, I think the unfortunate thing is there, if you want to take something to court, it's going to cost you, isn't it, in the first place? Well, it, it is, and a lot of people are very frightened of the courts as well. Hmm. You know, I'm, I'm no longer frightened of the courts because I don't know enough about the law, but I know enough to stand my ground in a court. You know, it's. I, I, met, I was fortunate in meeting a few people uh, and learning from them. You know, what, one of them was a, a friend. He's now dead, unfortunately, but he, he was called Lockie, and he was the one who arrested a guy trying to impersonate a judge at Birkenhead. Right. And he was the first person, I think it was in 157 years, to arrest a judge. <laughs> but he placed his hand on his shoulder and he said, I'm arresting you for treason, do you understand? And Judge Peak said, yeah, I understand because he knew he was committing treason because he didn't have his oath of office in court which you know a lot of people wouldn't know about no. but a judge is not a judge until he actually signs his oath of office to sit in as a judge in court out of court he's not a judge he's just a normal citizen hmm. people don't know yeah, it's got a quagmire, isn't it? Really, when you when you look at all that, like you say, it does scare most people when they when they're faced with something uh, uh, on legal terms like that. And a lot, like yeah. you say, a lot of it all goes back to the controls of religion in the first place, doesn't it? Exactly. You know, one of I was in court once with a friend, and the judge turned round to him and he said, uh, I, "I feel like." Uh, the, the judgment of Solomon here and straight away I got it and my friend got it because he's a solicitor but the prosecution didn't get it <laughs> and it was like oh fascinating but the judge was on our side because he knew we were being lawful yeah yeah and the, the other thing about judges it's their duty to guide you as well because I, I found you know, I, I went through a horrendous divorce and hmm. argued with the kids. And when I sacked the solicitors off, I, I, I gained more in court than I did the whole time with the solicitors. And just recently, a friend said, well, the judge is there to guide you. You know, if you've got a solicitor or a barrister, they're the ones doing it for you and the judge will keep his mouth shut. Right, yeah. Oh, so if you go in to defend yourself, basically, the judge will kind of be on your side. Be, well, maybe, or just to help you out, maybe. Yeah, he has the duty to point you in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose when you think about it, they do actually sort of, when well, they tell lawyers what to do, don't they? They'll tell them they can either say this or they can't say that. Yeah, so it, it does make sense. Yeah. And, you know, it's where, where all this was born from, is from religion and the courts. Yeah. We used to have uh, Saxon law, and then 
you know, when the country united, it was of the law of the Vatican, or papal law, and then, you know, it's evolved from there. But, you know, you go back to Saxon law, if you had a dispute with anybody, you could claim a home, home gang, which was a, a fight to the death, mm. trial by combat. Mm. Now, when you go to court, you go into trial. But you've got your champions, which is your barristers and your solicitors, to represent you. So rather than an actual physical fight now, you're fighting you know, on words or legalese. So that, that's where it was born from, you know, going to court. Yeah. And being tried by your, your uh, peers, the jury of 12 men or 12 women or 12 people. They were there to ensure that the fight was fair. And of course the winner was the one who killed the other. And that was by God's will. Hmm. I talk about it, the sage thing. I, mean, I, know, I know we've gone quite off the rails here a little bit, but the thing that always kind of puzzles me is when you've got someone who's obviously a blatant killer or a paedophile or something like that, and you've got a lawyer who is actually willing to defend them. You know, yeah. I don't know if, how you feel about. I mean, I, if I was a lawyer, I wouldn't want to defend that person. You know, a, a lot of them don't, but we have the right to go to trial. Mm. not what you've done you know you have the right to defend yourself in court yeah but um, but it's that particular lawyer I mean if if if, some, if I was a lawyer for instance or a solicitor and I was asked to defend a paedophile and actually try and get him off knowing that he was a a paedophile you know as guilty yeah, he's probably done all sorts of horrendous things I wouldn't want to defend him yeah I, I know exactly what you mean I mean I couldn't do it but it is the job of a solicitor to do it. Mm. You know, like I say, everybody has a right to a fair trial. Yeah. But, I mean, does it boil down to money in the end? Do, you know, if, if, um, with, with people like that, I wonder. But partly, but again, it is that, that right to have a fair trial. And the only way you can have a fair trial is if you either represent yourself or have somebody to represent you. Yeah. I mean, I suppose it boils down to that. That solicitor is part of the system, so you've got to have you've got to have part two halves of that system. And I suppose, even though he may defend you and think you're, but he, he could still think you're guilty. But he's got to defend you within, you know, so that it, it proves it within the law that you're either guilty or innocent. I yeah, suppose exactly. that's the way it works out, isn't it? Exactly. And people say, "Oh well, he got a good loop all the way." And it's like, no, there is no such thing as a loophole lawyer. Yeah. The law is the law. What makes a good, and I'll put in brackets, what makes a good loophole lawyer is a lawyer who's willing to do the research and look at the law. You know, I, uh, in recent years, I discovered this myself with a couple, few friends, uh, a very good friend of mine Mike he we were sat in my house and we we looked at a couple of aspects of the law and went wow this is interesting so let's form the Preston Cannabis Club which we did do and we applied for a license to supply members of the club with cannabis now before anybody says Oh, you all dope smoking weed, you know, <laughs> you all hippie types and whatnot. It's like, that was not the aim of setting up the club. The aim of setting up the club was pro to provide cannabis or cannabis products to members. Now, part of that is medical cannabis. It's a medicine. Yeah. And if you look into the law, you know, you go to court, they ask you to swear on the Bible and it says in the Bible in Genesis that God gave man all seed bearing plants for food and cannabis is a seed bearing plant so we looked at the law went on the home office website and it's third black and white UK government website you can apply for a license 
So, of course, we applied for the license, and we knew it would get knocked back. Yeah. Which it do. We were accused of, you know, going to do criminal activities. But how can you do a criminal activity if you've got a license? Now, we proved it in court that it is a strict liability offence not to have the license, which means exactly the same as if you're driving a car without a license, it's a strict liability offence. So you have the right to apply for a driving license so that you can drive a car. So we apply for the license for the cannabis club. Of course, we got turned down. So we judicially reviewed it, saying it was prejudiced. And we named Amber Rudd as the Home Secretary, who'd actually issued licenses, but she'd issued uh, one license to Victoria Atkins, MP's husband, and one license to Theresa May's husband, <laughs> who, who were members of a group which produce and export the largest shipment of medical grade cannabis in the world. Yeah, I that. <laughs> it's crazy. So, yeah. You know, I mean, Pablo Escobar couldn't have drank that one up. No. So anyway, that week we judicially viewed it, Amber Rudd resigned. <laughs> so I learned then that the power of law is stronger than any vaulting in this country. Mm. Or Got probably any country. I suppose the same thing happens in America as well, doesn't it? Or anywhere. Yeah. You know, but again, it's it's why have we got to go to the extremes to do it mm. and it's down to that control you know at the time you had Theresa May standing in public in parliament and saying cannabis has no medical value whatsoever mm. what well, husband's the largest exporter in the world of medical grade cannabis yeah get your head around that one that's right yeah you know so there's that duality and that control yeah and it's well isn't Theresa May supposedly elected by the public to do the public's business yeah my answer is no she's not you know she's chosen yeah uh, you know everybody's under the illusion that well we voted for this government you know like we voted for boris well sorry but it's her majesty's government and her majesty appointed him as prime minister yeah, she has the right to overrule anything Parliament says because it is her Parliament and it is also her law, the Crown. So, you know, once you get your head round that and get your head round the lawful and the legal, you start to understand how this country operates and how all of a sudden the world operates. Mm. You know, which goes back to like the Vatican and the power the Vatican has. Mm. It's like, you know, I, I call it the unholy trinity. The Vatican, the city of London, and Washington, D.C. Yeah, it's the triangle, isn't it? Yeah, all three are states within states. And, you know, in this country, the city of London, the Queen has to have permission to go into the city of London because it's a, it's a separate state to Britain. You know, people can't get their heads around it. No. It's it's where the, these laws of the mind, body and spirit are born from. Yeah. Because it, it's actually, the city of London, it's actually, the, it's actually got a circle around it, isn't it, with uh, poles. Is it red poles, I think, uh, which which kind of divides it from the rest of London, which is yeah. which is really way out there, if you think about it. I mean, we can, all, well, we can always all walk in and out of it without passports and things, but yeah. in actual fact, it is... It's, it's kind of like the banking capital, isn't it, of the world? Exactly. Which is what it is. Um, it's kind of run, with, which really runs Washington and also the Vatican. It also controls the law. Yeah. You know, which I, I will say, uh, before I, I say, uh, when you go into the city of London, if you look, there's dragons. Yeah. Now, dragons are very important. It's also the symbol of the Vatican is the dragon. But we'll go into that in a bit. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I definitely want to go further into the Vatican with you. <laughs> yeah, the city of London. Uh, you, 
got ships coming down the Thames to trade. So they're coming down a birthing canal and they get to the dock where they unload the goods uh, by the bankers because yeah, they're on the bank and the bankers then look at the water or the current for the currency. Mm. So, so you've got that. But when you go into court, you go into the dock. Yeah. Because <laughs> of course, because they're trying to extort the money off you. And of course, they fine you, so you give them the money. Now, the last time I went in court, I was, uh, I said, no, I'm not standing in the dock because I get, I'm happy here at sea. <laughs> so I, I just go well case dismissed and that was it yeah is that is that right is that what you so you don't have to go in the dock no no do you have to go in the dock so i mean most people are just uh, sort of led there and they sort of just go in there as a, well, i suppose of their own free will uh, thinking yeah. that you've got to be standing in the dock um, yeah, exactly. So, so you can actually not go in the dock, and um, what they have to dis- dis- dismiss whatever's going on. Yeah. Now, I first sussed onto this. We, uh, uh, somebody who used to be a friend, mm. he went to court and he stood where the barristers stand, and the judge says, "Is Mister Aspinall in court?" Of course, my friend, he points to his birth certificate and he said, he's there. And he went, well, who are you? And he said, I'm, I'm Rusty, the man. <laughs> and there an argument broke out and ten minutes later, the judge was calling him Rusty. So that's, the, again, it's a big fallacy in court. We are the human, not the person. The person is your birth certificate or your straw man. Right. So, the person, and it is in the Bible, you are the master of your own vessel. Of course, a vessel is a ship. Hence, the captain of the ship is called the master of the ship. So, when you're born, you know, as a male, you're called master. And then, you get to a certain age and they, they drop the master and start calling you mister. Yeah. And then, in, in law... If it's capital letters in your name, they're addressing your legal fiction and not the human. It's and also, if you know, if you know this on documents, you always ask you to sign in black ink. Yeah. Well, no, don't sign in red ink because that represents you signing in blood, and they don't like that because you're signing as a man so they can't actually reject that form if, it, if it's asking you to sign in black ink and you sign it in red can they not reject it oh they can reject it but you go to court and it's like no there's my testimony in I've signed in blood hmm. and they don't like that because you know what they're trying to do is extort money from yeah. you yeah so so if it says that you've got to sign it in black or they ask you to sign it in black so it's not actually a legal requirement really then that they... it's a legal requirement but it's not a lawful requirement right so that's the difference yeah so what you're doing is you're not actually doing anything illegal by, no. by refusing it but you're not doing something uh, lawfully which they would wish you to <laughs> If that uh, yeah. makes sense, yeah. Hmm, very confusing, but it's uh, very interesting, Frank. It, it is, and you know, this is where the Vatican got away with it for so long. Yeah. Because it, it, well, it's the word of God, and the Vatican brought the religion, and you know, they used it for their own purpose, and so why they eradicated the Knights Templars. Well, the Templars are heretics, hmm. so put them to death. It's the will of God, and it's not. <laughs> so, was it actually the Vatican that had the Templars eradicated in the? I mean, uh, eradicated as far as we know, because they did actually disappear underground, and it, as we've, we've mentioned, they turned into the uh, um, Freemasons and everything else, or connections yeah. to the Freemasons. Yeah. 
it was because of the power struggle, you know, King Philip of France and uh, Pope Clement, they were frightened of how much power the Templars were having. Mm. You know, the, the, the Templars became very, very rich, and they were richer than the Vatican and the King of France put together. But they were the first ones to, like, have, uh, oh, what do you call them, notes of, uh, basically a checkbook. You know, if you wanted to go on a pilgrimage from, say, Preston to, you know, Jerusalem, Rather than carry money with you, where you, there's a good chance of you being robbed, you were given a promissory note, so you handed in your money in Preston. Right. When you got to Jerusalem, you produce a promissory note, and then they give you your money back. Right. They, ch- they charge a fee for it. So, you know, they were getting a lot of riches like that, and then a lot of the barons and lords around the world, known world at the time, were donating their lands, yeah. riches to the assemblers. So it's kind of like the first Travers check. <laughs> yeah, they, they were. It, it was. That's where it came from. Mm. You know, it's like it used to be on the pound notes. I, I promised to pay the bearer uh, ten pounds in sterling silver. Mm. Now it's I just promised to pay the bearer ten pounds. Ten pounds of what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not too sure, but I think on Scottish pound notes it still says you, you, you promised the bird to pay the bearer in sterling silver. I might be wrong, but it's in recent years they still had it. Yeah. Yeah, I think they say it on the American notes as well, don't they? Something like that. Um, no, I, think, I just think it was in the 20s. The American. Uh, monetary system went to the uh, a private concern. Yeah, I just I just happen to have an American dollar in front of me. It says, uh, "This note is legal tender for all debts, public and private." Uh, yeah. And yeah, just on the back, it just says, "In God we trust." With the yeah. with the with the tr- with the uh, pyramid with the triangle on the top, which is flying off. Yeah. Now, what's that all about? Uh, I can't remember what it says in Latin, but it's basically the New World Order. Yeah, I knew it. Con- oh, I'm trying to read it. So I've got to be light on. <laughs> uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I, it's very puzzling that uh, the, the 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 pyramid and it's got the the top fit flying off of it. Um, well, if you go back to when America started, the the founding fathers. I think there was 35 of them, but 32 of them were Freemasons. Mm. So there's a lot of Freemasonry symbol in Washington, D.C. and and on the dollar. Yeah. But but the hidden side of it is, if you look on the dollar in the top right-hand corner, I forget which side it's on, but there's a little owl representing the god Morlock. And, you know, Bohemian Grove. Uh, you go there, there's a massive effigy of Morlock. And uh, Morlock was, was a god where they sacrificed children to him. Yeah, I can't actually see it. I'll look at it. It's the other I've got in front. I can't see an owl. Or can I? There's a, yeah, there's one that looks, look, if you turn it sideways, it looks like on the side of where the, um, pyramid is. Um. Oh, it's, it's in the top right hand corner of the, of the dollar. It's very, very small. You, you probably need a magnifying glass. Oh, I see, you're right. You can't actually see it with your naked eye. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's there. Yeah, interesting. And also, what's the bundle of... Uh, I forget what it's called, but it's the symbol of the fascists. What's that doing on the American dollar? Yeah. Yes. But the American dollar is printed by the Federal Reserve, which is a separate entity. Everybody thinks it's American, but it's not. It's a separate corporation. Hmm. Uh, uh, what's his name? JFK. He wanted to bring it back into America. That, that's where one of the conspiracies of why he was assassinated. That's true, yeah. I've heard that before, too. 
Um, it's probably all part of that, the, that banking, the, the triangle banking system, isn't it? like the, the uh, of London and the Vatican and Washington. Yeah, exactly. You know, you look for any trouble around the world, and them three country, them three states, they, they're behind it all. Hmm. I mean, we do hear a bit, a lot about. Um, hmm, the Jew, oh, I don't want to say the Jews. Uh, Israel being in, in control of everything. How, how do you see that? Uh, they are in a way, because like mainstream media, uh, you can trace it down to certain families, and one of the families is the Rothschilds. Yeah. They own a lot of the media, so you know, in present day, you speak out against Israel. And you get censored or you get up to court or whatever yeah. for being anti-Semitic. I'm just trying to see where the connection to the Vatican comes into that. Um, <laughs> and, and London type of thing. Uh, how they, they seem to be controlled. I, I do agree with you. They do seem to be controlled in everything. Um, and they've had so many um, international orders against them, haven't they? And they've, they've, they've not complied. You know, like the uh, United Nations um, things against them when they've done things that they didn't like <laughs> yeah <laughs> but so they've never they've never sort of um, bowed down to that have they no but you see you've got to get your head round what is Israel you know okay it's a state and it's set up for the Jews but the ones who pushed for the state of Israel were not really Jewish they were Khazars yeah the Rothschilds the, the symbol on the Jewish flag is the symbol of the Rothschilds. It's not the Star of David. And when you look at it in esoteric terms, it's two triangles, as above, so below. Mm. In actual fact, uh, Israel was set up by uh, England and America, wasn't it? Yeah. So uh, at the, the end of the Second World War. With the consent of the Vatican. Yeah. So it kind of, it was it set there as a as a sort of a, a thing, I don't know, like a, a sideways thing, so it doesn't draw attention to the other three, maybe, I don't know. Possibly. Uh, but again, it's the control over Jerusalem. Hmm. Or the Holy Land. It's, it's like, well, we can't give it to the Palestinians because they're Arabs. Hmm. So, you know, let's set up the State of Israel. At least we can control the Jews. But who, you know, the Jews... A lot of them are the money man. Yeah, well, that's why that's where this anti-Semitism comes in, isn't it? Um, yeah. Anti-Semitism is not actually hatred of the Jews, is it? It's actually not. hatred of the people at the top of Israel, basically. That's what that's, I mean, that's what that's the way I understand anti-Semitism. You know, but no, I understand it as well. But a lot of people sort of they, they think it's just hatred of the Jews. If you're a Jewish and someone says that, that, that you know, it's, it's all to do with that. But oh, that's not how I see it. I think they misunderstand what anti-Semitism means a lot of the time. Oh, well, I've got a very good friend who is Palestinian, and unfortunately his mother died last year. But oh, I once had a conversation with her, and she remembers when she was younger breastfeeding the neighbour because they were all hard up and mm. you know short of money and for food and stuff and her neighbour she couldn't produce breast milk for her child now the child was Jewish so you've got a Palestinian mother breastfeeding her Jewish child mm. and they lived in harmony and lived in peace yeah well it's all the same milk isn't it yeah that's yeah exactly but along comes some organisation or a group of people and you've got to divide to rule. You know, play one against the other, which is, you know, standard. We've got it in this country at the moment, you know, playing one person against the other. Mm. And, you know, what, what's really going on? You know, you, you've got this coronavirus, everybody's staying locked down. And while everybody's in lockdown, you've got people going out putting up 5G masks. Yeah. Are, are they immune to this virus or what? Yeah, I don't know what's going on there, Frank. I mean, I, I think we get to this thing about control again, and it seems like there's something, there's something else going on. 
Um, it, just, it always is. It, it's always a small screen for something else that is really going on. Yeah, I mean, what is all this about the, the 5G and these masks going up? I mean, that's not an essential job, is it? No, it's not. You know, they're not key workers. I mean, do, do you feel that maybe a lot of this is a smokescreen um, to keep people off the streets from protesting about the mask going up? Because you know there's quite a faction against the, this 5G network. Yeah, I think it's part of it. But I, I also, I've been watching the rising hatred against Muslims and now against the Chinese. Mm. You know, people are getting fired up and it's the media the pumping them with stuff you know like there's Muslims all around the world I forget how many billions there yeah. are but then you've got a group like ISIS and you know in my mind they're not Muslims and you, you talk to Muslims and they don't want to know ISIS hmm. they, even they say they're not Muslims yeah I agree with you yeah and there's also, you, you, you find the race, cult, you know, people say about the ra- about being racist when you talk about Muslims. Being Muslim is not a race, is it? It's a religion. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, and that kind of winds me up a little bit when I say, well, you, you know, someone will say, well, you're just being racist. Or, I don't, not me, I mean, <laughs> don't get me wrong. I mean, when you hear people say something about Muslims, um, you know, they start saying about, are oh, you being racist? But it's, it's not being racist at all. It's like calling a Christian you know, it's it's it's, it's not a race. <laughs> exactly, the Ku Klux Klan Christian. Yeah, I mean it's even like even Jewish. That's not that's not a that's not a race either. Because I mean you've no. got all types of um, of Jewish people from different countries. Same yeah. as you've got Catholics and Christians and everything else. That's a, I know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's a tribe in Zimbabwe who were Jewish. <laughs> you know, it, it, it sounds funny, but they are the Jewish. They have Jewish names. They practice the Jewish religion. Yeah. And they're all black. Well, I, do, I do think people get that mixed up quite a lot. Um, you know, if you, like someone's... Particularly, I think, with the... With the um, the, the Jewish and also the Muslims, there seems to that seems to be something that's played on a lot the, the racial card, and I don't think it should be. You know, I think people should realise that it's not a race; it's no. a, it's actually a religion, and it's and it's just the old religious argument again, every time. Yeah. Well, growing up, you know, when I were in Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, you know, you saw. Me and a friend used to go to a village called Bala Bala and we'd sit with the chief of the village and have some right good conversations. Mm. And he once asked us, he said, why are the people in Northern Ireland fighting against each other? Aren't they both Christians? And we went, yeah, they are. Mm. And he's like, yeah, why are they fighting against each other? Because they are both Christians. It's like, which one's right? Which one's wrong? Yeah. You know, you know, thankfully there's not as much trouble there now, right? but there still is a, a bit of animosity between the two groups. Yeah, which, again, says a lot about religion, doesn't it? Why is it that religions have got to fight against each other? Yeah. You know, even if it's the same religion of, the, of a different type. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, which is what the Catholics were, and the Vatican just totally eradicated them. Mm. And we tried it with the Knights Templars and tried to eradicate them. But it, again, it's that control. And when you look at the, certainly the Vatican or Christianity in the Western world, it, we, we've got ancient sites and the, a lot of these ancient sites, there's a lot of esoteric stuff there. Mm. The church tried to take over and control. Now, I'll give you an example. The ley lines exist. There's energy lines that flow around the, the planet. Yeah. They do exist. I've felt them, uh, you know, through martial arts and Tai Chi and Chi energy. You know, I, I can feel them. So I know they're there. Now, Stonehenge is one of the most world-famous ones. 
where it is a crossing of ley lines so the churches or the, you know the Vatican used to come along and go right we'll take over that ancient site and we'll build the church there and where the energy lines cross energy spirals upwards so they built the, the church steeples there mm. of course the church steeples is sometimes called spires and it comes from the word aspire because the energy is spiraling upwards or aspiring so you know the, the Vatican knew that these energy lines exist now remember I said about the dragons yeah. in the yeah. city of London the Chinese call these ley lines dragon lines that's the power and I think a lot of like English uh, mythology like Saint George and the dragon it wasn't literally killing a reptile or a dragon it was fighting an energy or fighting an energy which was used by others mm. You know, uh, research I did into a lot of the layer lines, which started to blow my mind, but it was when I lived in Germany with an ex-girlfriend. I said to her one day, oh, let's go to Eckstenstein. And she just looked at me, why? <laughs> I went, well, I'm interested because it's a major uh, site of, of layer lines crossing. You know, the energy there must be good. She said, well, I don't want to go because it was used by the Nazis. So, of course, the research I did, I found out it was one of the headquarters of the SS. Hmm. And the SS was trying to influence Winston Churchill and other politicians because one of the ley lines runs right through Westminster. So they were using their ley lines to send down psychic energy or a chi energy to try and influence people which is still going on today with government. Yeah. You know, we, we all know about MK Ultra and Operation Stargate and the remote viewers, yeah. but that didn't disappear. It just went underground. Yeah. There's still... And it kind of it's takes just, us back for, to 5G, doesn't it, Frank, when you think about it? What's going on yeah. there? Yeah, it's like... As a human being, we... We are a living energy and we, we are, we're on a frequency. So this 5G is operating at a frequency. It has to affect us in some way. You know, and I don't care what anybody says, whether they say, oh, well, it, it won't do. It, it will do in some way or another. It's a microwave technology or it's an energy, it's a frequency. Now, Frequencies in our face is music. You know, you look at the six strings on a guitar, the frequencies on them notes are the same frequencies on these six lower chakras. Hmm. And it's by music around the world, you know, like drumming in Africa, it resonates with the Africans, but you can feel it in your danchan or your sacral chakra in your stomach. You know, you, you go to rock concerts. You can feel the energy in certain parts of your body. And people say, Oh, have you heard such a song? The hairs on the back of my neck are standing yeah. up. It's because it's hitting a certain frequency and affecting one of your chakras. So any form of frequency affects you. Now, used to be the government would say, Well, it's safe to live under a pylon with the electricity lines going overhead. We now know that you get cancer from it. So don't live under one. You know, that, that's a scientific fact now. So science has a duality where it's saying, well, frequencies can affect you, but the minute you talk about chi energy, no, that doesn't exist. So there's still that denial. And uh, going back to that write-up in... Phenomenon magazine about me. There was a, a psychologist in America added to it, and his his psychology findings about it were very fascinating because it weren't denying it. It was saying that it is a phenomenon; it does exist. 
which you know I, I found very fascinating. She's one of the very first scientists to say that oh there is something here. Yeah. But you know, scientists like Tesla, he knew it existed mm. and he got persecuted. Uh, people like uh, oh what's his name? Uh, oh, I've forgotten his name. It, it's eluding me. He, he he built an organ machine. He he called Qi energy organite, like organ energy. And Kate Bush did a video, you know, running up the hill. Oh right, is that that's, that's what that's right. He, he was all about that, mm. you know. He was, this guy. Oh, I didn't know that. Now the the you know, it's not Victor Shoemaker. He he was the one who worked for the Nazis on energy and the flow of water. Uh, it'll come to me what his name is. But anyway, he, the FBI arrested him and took all his papers and shut him down, basically, because they didn't want the world to know that chi energy does exist and that you can control it. Mm. You know, he was... The machine he built was to throw organ energy into the universe and prefer, uh, get clouds together and make rain. So it was the first weather modif- excuse me, it was the first weather modification. Now I watched a, a, a program and it was the rescue of Vietnam POWs from Sun Tse. It was a, a camp where they knew there was a lot of uh, POWs and the special forces got an operation together they went in and found that the village was deserted and it turns out that the CIA were doing a weather modification creating rain and the, the river next to the camp was flooding and it was in threat of uh, flooding the village so they deserted the village but the CIA and the special forces weren't working together back then. Now a lot of people don't know that. You know, they say a weather modification. Oh yeah, it doesn't exist. Oh, it does exist. You know, there, there's your evidence. Mm. It's in, you know, back into the Vietnam War, it exists. That name you were trying to think of, uh, Frank, was it Wil- Wilhelm Reich? That's the one. Yeah, yeah. I've just Wilhelm I've just googled Reich. it. <laughs> Yeah, it is Wilhelm Reich. Wilhelm Reich, yeah. Yeah, he did, uh, oh. 19, in the 1930s by Wilhelm Reich. Yeah. Now, my fascination with it is the, the organ, or chi. Now, I've got, I've got a Curlian camera which photographs the energy around the fingertips. Hmm. Did a lot of research with, with that, which, you know, in itself is fascinating because Tesla was one of the first to try it and it weren't until Semyon Curlian discovered it by accident where a high charge of electricity going through the body turns the aura or the chi into positive ions and you can record it on photographic paper well, these days now it can be recorded onto computers and stuff but, you know, for science to say, oh, the aura or the chi doesn't exist, it's, well, what exactly is being photographed? You know, something's being photographed. Yeah. And as a, a psychic or somebody who's developed a, an awareness of chi, I could do readings from these photographs. You know, well, you can see like, the colours in aura, can't you, Frank? I mean, I, I can see, I can see aura around my hand. But I can't see any colours. Yeah. All I see is like a grey mist. Um, yeah. So I'm not developed, but you can actually see the colours. Yeah. Which I'm going to come to uh, a point. <laughs> Our friend Larry Warren. Yeah. The first time I saw him talk was at Probe Conference about 14 years ago. I was also speaking there that time. Uh, Ten minutes into his talk, I got up and walked out. And I'll reveal for the first time in public why. 
I was watching him, and then I drifted off a little bit, and we're watching his aura. And I knew from his aura that he was lying. Really? Yeah. Because when somebody tells a lie, the aura, which is like a, around the person, on from the top starts to split and forms a V. There's a split in the aura, and it's a V shape, and it goes right down to the tongue. <laughs> The Native Americans call it white man speaks with four tongues. Yeah, well, we know that saying, don't we? So, for everybody who believes Larry Warren, he's a liar. Yeah. And I saw it myself. And, you know, I, I, I weren't interested in the guy till in recent years. And then, you know, when he claimed to be a hell's angel. Hmm. So, every time I look at the guy now, or do a little bit of research or come across things, his, his lies are totally blatant. Yeah, well, I think we all know that anyway. Anyone that's looked any yeah. uh, closely into him now should know that, really. Even the ones yeah. that say they don't, <laughs> I still believe him, I'm yeah. sure. Uh, although they're stupid or, uh, you know. Cognitive dissonance. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's just an out-and-out liar fantasist. But, yeah, that's where my first dealings were with yeah. him. White man speaks before it tongue. I mean, I think it's, there's no. probably a lot of people out here don't know who are we talking about Larry Warren. He actually wrote a book called Left at Eastgate with Peter Robbins about the Rendlesham Forest incident. Uh, and he's been, over the last, well, probably getting on for four years now, he's been outed as a complete liar, really. And um, that's what Frank's referring to. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's... You know, it's just part of the aspect of control. Yeah. Because I was approached about 10 years ago by, I don't really know who they were, but I would put it down to MI5, British Intelligence. But they wanted me to sit in on interviews. And it was to see whether people were lying or not. Mm. Now, I firmly believe it was for interrogation of prisoners you know, in the Middle East, where rather than torture them or question them, and by looking at their aura, you can see whether they're lying or not. And I, I have met a couple of other psychics from different parts of the world that did work for the Americans doing exactly that. Mm. They would sit behind a, a mirror, you know, a one-way mirror, uh, sorry, a two-way mirror, and just mark down much like a lie detector test, whether that person's actually lying or not, because the aura does not lie. Mm. You know, it, going back to like the witchcraft trials and everything, you know, uh, there's old sayings like, oh, that person sees red with anger. Oh, red, red mist rising. It comes up from the stomach. The aura starts to go red. You've got somebody who's green fingered. Somebody who likes gardening or being with nature all around the hands, it's very green. Yeah. You got somebody who's very depressed. Oh, they've got a dark cloud over them. Well, I imagine when, when you when you first meet someone, Frank, you must be able to tell roughly what they're like. You must see their aura straight away, do you? I do. <laughs> <laughs> the older I've got, the more I use it as well yeah. to keep idiots away from me. No, I was just wondering, the first time I met you was at, uh, we, we, I think I met you, I don't know, it would, would have been at Probe a few years back, probably about five years ago now, wouldn't it, I think. Um, and then I met you again at, in Manchester at, uh, oh, wow, was it, what was that? That was the, the thing with, the, when you were talking there, weren't you? At the, um, the Fuse of the Years Museum, I think it was. I oh, in Berry uh, at Repcon. Yeah, that's when I, that's right. That's when I come and introduce myself to you again and said hello, because I'd only said hello to you at the probe concert, uh, conference concert, conference, uh, you know, briefly. And um, yeah. I just kind of wondered what sort of um, vibes you picked up from anyone there, because because uh, <laughs> there, there was quite a few funny characters there, weren't there? Yeah, there was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was very sort of one of the speakers. It, it was, uh, he, he said, he, he come out during his speech that his parents worked for MI6. Right. And then 
after I did my talk, he come up, introduced himself, and he said, I was born in Salisbury, in Rhodesia. And like, straight away, I'm thinking, well, why have you told me that when you've just told me your parents were MIC? <laughs> yeah. It's like, something doesn't match there, or what are you trying to do to me? So I've just stayed clear of the guy. Yeah. I don't trust yeah, him. Yeah, I think that the fellow you're talking about, he was actually in politics as well, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Yeah. And I think he's so, been uh, mentioned a few times in, in a, I'm not going to mention his name. Um, but I think he's been linked with a, a few other people. I think they've, a few of them are charlatans, all seem to be working together. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's my opinion too. But uh, I think if anyone wanted to find out who that actually was, if you look at the Repcon con- conference, you'll probably find out who it is we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Well, there were four, four speakers and he's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> he's not American either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, 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 to be honest, I didn't know much about him at the time. And I know he, I think he was picking up on a few people's um, comments and things in the audience when they were asking questions. And I think, yeah, he was working a bit like one of these fake uh, psychics, wasn't he? It seemed to be to me, you know. Yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway, that's that's just a buy and a buy. <laughs> yeah, cold reading. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I know there's a few things going on behind the scenes about this particular person and a few others. Whether anything will ever happen about it, I don't know, but... Um, uh, they they have got a few people working on things <laughs> with a few of these people, but uh, I shall say no more about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, getting back to the Vatican, yeah. <laughs> as we were, <laughs> the key energy around the planet, they they definitely harnessed it for their own good. Mm. You know, uh, it, it's like anything in magic. Magic is neutral. Whether you use it black magic or white magic is the human intent on yeah. it. Yeah. And I, I believe the Vatican dabbles in the black magic side of it. The satanic the side. Control. Yeah. You know, I don't like using the word satanic because I don't believe in Satan. Just like I don't oh, believe right. in Oh, right. I thought it was just a term of, um, yeah. No, I don't, I don't believe in Satan either, but I think it's just a word that's used, um, um, yeah, yeah. You know, I suppose loosely, really, as a as a term to be used as our uh, evil, evil. Um, yeah, um, exactly. It's, it's pure evil. Yeah. You know, it's, it's it's created by man. It's evil. You know, chi is neutral. Now, I'll use chi to heal people, but I'm also capable of using chi to kill people. Mm. You know, especially Denmark or Death Touch. You know, if I couldn't, like, kill somebody with just my fingers. Yeah. That's why I'll start a good side of you, Frank. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's just by knowing where to strike. Yeah. It's in chakras or it's in pressure points. You know, you disrupt in the chi in somebody and you can kill yeah. them. Or you can seriously hurt them. You know, it's... It, it's I'm proud of it. Because it's given me an understanding of how to heal people. Sure, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, you, you've got that power, but you're not the type of person that would go around doing that sort of thing, you know. Oh, no, no, definitely not. The, the only time I would use it is to defend my children mm. or defend myself. If, if the situation arose, I would use it. Yeah. But no, I don't. To. I'd rather use it for the good of mankind. Yeah. But it, it's like anything, everything has a positive and negative, yin and yang, and you can't exist without the other. So there is evil in the world, but there's also good in the world. And a lot of people don't see that one, see that side of it. Mm. It's like this coronavirus crap. You know, unfortunately it is killing people, but it, it's so minute, it's unreal. Yeah about it it's all negative negative no let's turn it to something positive you know people are recovering from yeah, it yeah there's a hell of a lot more, more re- recovering they're all dying aren't they yeah exactly but people don't see that no. people are living in 
Yeah. Yeah, I say most of the people so that have, have died, with... they've been, so they've got underlying problems anyway, and they probably would have died from a, a bad bout of the, the normal flu anyway. And, you know, most of the things and you hear. Eddie Large died the other day, you know, resting yeah. peace, poor guy. But he died from heart failure, hmm. not from the virus. No, but they're saying it's a... Yeah, the they, that from the virus. They're just lumping everything together, aren't they? It seems like anyone that's dying now, they call it the coronavirus. Yeah, and it, it, it's wrong. It, but, again, it's that assault on the human psyche hmm. to get us all in fear. You know, that's what the Vatican has been doing. He eradicated the Knights Templars, so everybody, oh, we've got to live in fear. And it's like, fear the Lord, fear God. Mm. Uh, Dave Allen, the comedian, do you believe in God, young boy? No. Well, imagine a candle, you know, burning your finger. Does it hurt? Yes. Yeah. Well, imagine... It being all around your body for eternity that's what will happen to you if you don't believe in God yeah. I was kind of brought up with that you know being a Catholic myself and like what, what the hell is this about yeah. <laughs> you know and it's about control yeah. I mean uh, let's put it like this we've got to say this for time Frank for everyone out there there is a coronavirus but and, and also we should all, all actually try and do our best to stay away from it all you know, stay at home and like we're being asked to do, or told to do. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so we, we're not treating it lightly, are we, Frank? We're just saying that... Um, Don't be afraid of it, but be wary. Yeah, be wary of it. But um, I, we, we, yeah. I personally don't think it's as bad as everyone's trying to tell us it is. And we, I think, personally, there's something else going on besides that. Um, yeah. But Well, put it in perspective, uh, Yeah. Yesterday's statistics... There was 200,000 people around the world have died from coronavirus. Mm. But there's 3,000 3, people, uh, women, have died in childbirth. Yes, that's right. That's, that's what you've got to think about. Look at the positive side of it. And and also, I think it's only about like a point 0.1. Oh, sorry. It weren't 200,000. It was 50,000. There's, there's 1 million people who have got it or have been diagnosed with it. 50,000 have died from it. But 200,000 have recovered yeah. from it. So 50,000 deaths compared to 303,000 deaths of childbirth kind of puts it more into yeah, perspective. It does. I mean, I don't know how you feel. I, I actually think that's been going around for a bit longer than um, they've actually admitted to as well. Because there's been an awful bad lot of um, flu viruses things going around since before Christmas. I know I had a bad fat of it, and my wife Jill did too. I've heard that lots of other people had it as well. And then after Christmas, it seemed to come back again, another really bad bout of it. Um, and then we get this coronavirus popped up. Uh, I, I, I'm yeah. just wondering if it's all related anyway. It probably is. You know, because you know, I've, I've never, I've never known a, a, a cold, or like a fluey type of thing that I've, you know, because it sort of knocks I'll, us out I'll for a couple of days. There's different strains of the coronavirus. Yeah. So, so is it? Well, I did hear that there was some sort of a practice session going on about six weeks before this coronavirus um, appeared on our on our um, shores or on, or across the world. Um, there was there was some sort of a a, um, a practice session going on in America, wasn't there? That they said, and it, and they were talking about a coronavirus getting out into the into the uh, into the air. Yeah. So yeah. you've got to ask yourself, well, why suddenly were well, they were practicing on it, and it suddenly happened? You know. Yeah, exactly. You know, like why were they practicing against the terrorists attacking any? Well, yeah, that, that, that happens as well. I mean, I'm not saying that some of these terrorist attacks haven't happened, but you do. There are questions often asked or, or left um, wanting answer, answers after them, don't they? See, people will say, well, it's a coincidence. Yeah. I don't believe in coincidences. No. Things is for a reason. You know, or somebody's controlling something or whatever. You know, there's no conspiracy there, but I don't believe in coincidences. No. 
Anyway, let's, let's pop back into the Vatican again. I mean, here, <laughs> the Vatican's full of loads of actually all, uh, old um, manuscripts and all sorts of things going back thousands of years that we never, we, we've never been given a chance to see. What do you reckon they hold? Uh, well, let, let's look at uh, Saint Bernadette and Lourdes. No, not Lourdes. Uh, Fa- Fatima. Mm. The three children at Fatima. Uh, allegedly, the Virgin Mary appeared to them, and she gave them uh, prophecies. They wrote down the prophecies, and they were given to the Vatican. Now, the Vatican have released the prophecies bar one, and they were supposed to release it in the 1960s, but they never did. Oh. It's like straight away. It's like, well, why not? Yeah. Why are you not releasing this prophecy? What was uh, given to be, you know, released in 1960? Why are you going against the word of the Virgin Mary? You know, it, 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 it's again, it's that control. Whatever she said to them kids, and whatever their Vatican is holding back on it, they're not telling us the truth. No. I mean, it's, it's the same. I mean, I think with, the thing is, all these all these things that are held by the Vatican, all these artifacts and manuscripts and everything, they actually belong to the people themselves, don't they? Not to the Vatican. Exactly. You know, the Dead Sea Scrolls. What what's really in them? Mm. You know, it's what well we we kind of do know what's in the Book of Enoch, but why was that omitted from the Bible? You know, the scriptures. Yeah. It's, is of Mary Magdalene. Why are they omitted? Yeah, was that when the King the King James the First Bible was it? Was that the was that the, the uh, when a lot of stuff was left out of it? Or was that another one? Yeah, no, it is when King James translated the Bibles. Yeah, they chopped a lot of it out, didn't they? Yeah, and it's like, well, why? Yeah, and again, it's like taking away from who we really are or what our existence really means. You know, the master of our own vessels. You know, they're taking it away from us. Mm. It's like, why, why are they building churches on ley lines and saying they don't exist? Mm. You also have to you think know. about, um, the obelisks as well, don't you? You got the, you got the obelisk in London, you got the obelisk in Washington, and I believe there's one in the Vatican as well, isn't there? Yeah, there is right, right in the middle of so, the Saint Peter. Yeah, so right. that's kind of like, um, like you said about um, draws down power of some yeah. kind. Um, so is that like a controlling mechanism? I, I believe so. It goes back to hermetic magic, you know, back to Egyptian times. You know, there's, there's something. Well, well, let's let's put it this way: our computers today are controlled by a silicon chip. Silicon is quartz, mm. or quartz crystal. Now, obelisks contain minerals and stone and quartz crystals. They, they have a certain power or generate a certain yeah, frequency. Probably, yeah. And, you know, they, they are using it for good or for bad, one, one of the two. I, I think they're using it for, to control people, you know, through mind control. There are setting out a frequency which disrupts a human body and you know we know through MK Ultra that you hit people with certain frequencies you can't can't control them or you can kill them hmm. you know 5G what exactly can it do well we do know that it can be used as a weapon yeah you know that that is a scientific fact so again, it's what frequency are we going to use it at? You know, or what frequency is it going to run? Yeah, at? are they going to link all of our minds into it, kind of thing, isn't it? Because that kind of um, that's that's kind that seems to be kind of where it's going. Yeah, I mean, we're all we're all hooked. You see everyone walking around gazing at their telephones all the time. Um, yeah, are they going to be hooked into the five G network? <laughs> now, what a lot of people don't know is a lot of these. 5G mass are actually in church steeples. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they're, they're hidden from people, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Mm. But 
why in a church steeple when it's on the crossing of a ley line? Right. You know, they're empowering that frequency with the natural energy of the yeah. earth. Where did you get that information from, Frank? Is that, so is that available to, to look at? Uh, the first I, I, I knew about it was church near where I live. Right. There were a lot of, you know, electrical contractors. I don't know what you're doing. Mm. We're installing aerials inside the church, Steve. Right. I suppose, yeah, rather than put a pile on, they've already got the, they've already got the, the hype there, haven't they? Because just bung it in there. Yeah. So I, I was like, what the hell? And then I, I saw you talking to a guy I know, and he said, oh, I'm doing some research in it. Now, I don't know whether it's still on the internet, but, uh, him and his mate had a bit of a fallout and over the copyright of who owns what. Mm. But he went round uh, a lot of churches and went inside and was showing on the film these selfs of, you know, aerials and frequencies of 5G were inside the church steeples. Uh, what was he? <coughs> I know him as James Preston, but he goes under the name of... Uh, Somebody Barraclough, uh, oh, I can't remember the first name he uses, but he, he did a couple of interviews with me, and that's how I know uh, him and his mate fell out, because one of the interviews he did with me on Chi Energy, he got taken down off the internet, and when I asked him, he said, because I've had a fallout, you know, of the copyright. Right. But it was, he, he was connected with New Horizons in St. Anne's that, that the beginning and he, he kind of like broke away from it and went independent but yeah he, he did a lot of research into it so you know I, I got some feedback off him on it you know you can say well it's a conspiracy but the fact remains that these aerials and masts are inside church steeples mm. they're in place well, super. Have a look into that. That's uh, it's quite scary and uh, interesting at the same time, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it makes the world go round. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you do hear a, a lot about uh, some of these churches. You were talking about ley lines as well. They've got like uh, portals and things. I've heard about. Um, right. Yeah. Have you ever experienced any of that? Uh, as a kid, you know, parents used to take take us to church every Sunday you know my, my parents were Catholics and I'd always pass out in church and when I look back now it's because the chi energy inside the church was so powerful it was literally knocking me out mm. knocking me uncle I mean growing up you know when the uh, the film The Omen came out my daddy used to call me Damien <laughs> you know going back to the you know, being a child and being unconscious in church and stuff. And I can remember saying, I don't want to go to church, I don't want to go to church. Because I knew I was going to pass out in church. So eventually, the parents, well, we'll leave you at home. And it weren't until I got to about the age of nine, I, I, I rebelled against it totally. Because it, it, it felt wrong for me. You know, the energy inside the church is, just wasn't right for me. And even to this day now, you know, friends and family, you know, even my own daughter, Abigail, you know, me, my ex-wife got her christened in a Catholic church. I went, but I didn't participate. I, I stayed right at the back, and after 10 minutes, I went outside, because mm. inside the church just wasn't right. It, it goes against my natural chi. It's like, I feel it, you know. I feel these ley lines and I've been investigating one in North Wales at the moment uh, I'll not give too much away because I'm going to do a talk at Conscious Tribal Gathering uh, which is held at the place where I first you know, experienced this energy but uh, literally from Brancastle in Clangollan all the way across the Irish Sea to the hill of Tara there's a straight line of energy and uh, along that line there's some fantastic things and it runs through the field where the conscious tribal gathering is 
that's where I first felt it. But uh, along that line, literally three miles from it is where Sasha Christie were abducted by the reptilians. Mm. Uh, not far away from there is where a UFO came down in the Berwyn Mountains. Uh, there's another one a bit further out. There's also the hidden Atlantis. There's also the last genocide of the Welsh speaking people. It's all along this ley line and it's fascinating what I've been uncovering. Mm. You know, uh, also two saints, Catholic saints, but I can't find any information out about them. It's as though they just suddenly appeared and then disappeared, but they became saints. Well, it sounds so like if, if you're going if you, if you, if you're, you're to be doing that talk somewhere, perhaps um, perhaps in another few bumps you'll come back and give, do that talk on here if you like. <laughs> Yeah, when, you, when you've I'll uncovered all everything you're going to uncover. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. No, no problem there. Yeah, it'd be great. So, so it, it's all in my mind what I've been uncovering. Yeah, it sounds. Um, uh, you know, Sasha's a good friend of ours. I mean, people out there, Sasha is a good friend of ours. Uh, she's done a few shows with me on here, um, but um, yeah, oh, yeah, it does sound interesting. Yeah, when I first started looking at it, it, it was oh, about ten years ago. Uh, Truth Juice had a gathering there, and I was invited to do a talk. And I'm going through a bit of turmoil in my life at the time. And I discovered this ley line, and I used to sit on this ley line. Mm. And people used to say to me, "You've not moved, right like, now." But for the first time in public, now I'll say it. I was sat there because I was enjoying the energy. Huh. It, was, it was fantastic. But I never looked any more into it. It was just, oh, that's my spot. I'm sitting there and I'm enjoying it. I'm taking in everything that's happening around me. Even though people were taking the mickey and going, you've not moved. Did, did you actually go to your tent last night? <laughs> but no, I just found the spot and I go there often now. You know, I, Sometimes I go on my own camping. Yeah, there. I know where you say I'm going on camping. So that's one of the places you go, is it? Yeah, it is. I, I just love it there, and I love doing Tai Chi there as yeah. well. You know, it's, it just I'm at peace. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the thing is with you, Frank. You're all, you're all really at peace with yourself, aren't you? Now, I think you you had quite a, a horrendous early life. Um, and yeah, you, and you understand yourself. I think that's that's probably one of the most important things that uh, anyone could discover about themselves. Yeah, definitely. You know, a, a lot of it did come through martial arts. Mm. Uh, a lot of it, you know, came through me, my ex-wife because she pushed me. You know, she, you no, know, if, you, if you're talking about, it, do it. So I like. I, I, I did have like free range to start investigating and experiencing stuff and you know so whatever I think of her you know at least that was something positive she did for me yeah you know it was uh, it was good it was a good experience being married to her yeah in but one way or another being, yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's uh, I understand myself now what what motivates me what gets to me how people do try to control me yeah. and not, not having no it. well it's like I think I've described you as this I think you're you're one of the actual sorts of the earth Frank that's, what, that's the way I kind of think of you um, you well, know you, you wouldn't want to mess around with you but at the same time we understand you and we know I know you for, for what you are you're a humanist aren't you you know and um uh, and I think you understand what well, you know, you understand what good and bad is. That's the, I think that's the important thing is uh, here, yeah. and um, yeah. and and you treat it, uh, uh, you know, as, as the way it deserves, whichever whichever one it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's something. The best way I can describe it is when you get a gut feeling. Most people don't listen to it and then later on they'll go oh I wish yeah, I'd listened yeah, to it yeah I think we all get that don't we 
it's learning to listen to it. Yeah. That's half of it. You know, things are for a reason. Yeah. It, it's like, you know, anybody sat in a crowded room and you start feeling on, on edge and you think, who the hell's, what's that about? Is somebody stirring at me? And you turn around and somebody is stirring yeah. at you. And it's like, well, how do you know? And it, it's, it's part of change. Yeah. You know, you're in your field or in your aura and you pick it up on yeah. it. Yeah, I must admit, I'm, 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 I've, I've felt things about people and I've got to know them and you think, oh, you know, you, you report, accept them into your world and then you find out they're not quite what they used to, what, what you thought they were, you know. I've, I've learnt to my, um, upset uh, quite a few times, you know, about yeah. things like that. But, um, really you should actually go on your first feelings. Yeah, definitely. That's, uh, you know, there's some people around me now. You know, they wanting to be my best friend, and I, I just keep them around. Mm. Like, it's like, no, no, stay away from me. You know, like then at the same time, there are some really nice people around me. Yeah, yeah. But I'll put them in. Yeah. Like I say, I mean, you 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 know what good and bad is, and I think you can tell who the good ones and the bad ones are. <laughs> Hey, anyway, I think we're going to have to leave it there, Frank. I mean, we've done oh, boy, over two hours now, so I think we'd better leave it there. Right. <laughs> but uh, it's fantastic, though. Like I said, though, if you if you fancy coming back on again in you know a few months after you've done that talk and after you've done the rest of your investigation, it'd be, be brilliant yeah. to have you back on and uh, tell us what you found. Yeah, I'd be delighted to. Um, you know, as I say, this well, this is a return to the show. You was here about a year ago, or just over, and uh, yeah. you, you sort of underlined a lot of what we were talking about then, or you were talking about. And um, I think it's fascinating the, the you know the, the Vatican and the Knights Templar and everything. And you know, I think you're the you're the go-to man for that. But I yeah. I think the trouble is it always leaves more questions than answers at the end of it, doesn't it? Well, yeah, we can uh, you know if people ask questions. We can always address them in the next. Yeah, one. that's right. You know, a two-hour show. I mean, I, I reckon what I'm investigating now with this layer land, I can do it in about an hour. Yeah. So we can combine, you know, two hours into yeah. it. Yeah. When do you re- when do you reckon you'll you'll be doing that talk? Uh, it's supposed to be end of July. Right. That's if we're not all still locked in. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, it's going to go ahead. But if there's still a lockdown, I'll still do the show anyway. Yeah. Oh, in fact, let's say if you're doing it in July, let's put it, maybe make it for around about September time, eh? Yeah, yeah that'd probably that'd be, about, be, be about the right time for it, wouldn't it? Yeah, that'd be brilliant. Yeah. All right then, Frank, that's, that's great. You've got a date. I'll, I'll mark you in the calendar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. But anyway, Craig, it's been great having you on again. Thanks for coming back and uh, spreading your, you know, sharing your time, even though we're all in lockdown anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're enjoying your uh, prison time. <laughs> that, oh, yeah, that, okay. that lovely new motorbike you've got, you can't go out as much as you'd like. No, but I'm going to go for a ride oh, yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> I blame you. <laughs> you've, yeah. you've only got to put your armpit on and go, was it about 160? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Frank. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming on, and uh, it's been great talking to you again, as always. And uh, as I say, I'll, I'll mark you on the calendar for around about September time, and I'll send you a, a date and all that, and we'll sort something out. But that sounds good. All right. Brilliant. Anyway. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Frank. And um, anyway, you've been listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network and Paranormal Dimensions. I'm David Young, and goodbye, Frank. Thanks. Thanks a lot again, Frank. If anyone listening to this is still planning on going out and doing paranormal investigations or, in fact, anything else that they shouldn't be doing, please stay at home and please stay safe and please keep everyone else safe. Thank you. Paranormal Dimensions is as bright and powerful as our celestial star, the sun. And although it's expending thousands of pounds of energy every minute of the day, have no fear. There's plenty left.
Paranormal Dimensions is a regular feature on Mondays on the Paranormal UK radio network.